Uh, we're Michelle Carr and Patrick McNamara, and we're co-hosts of the new video series, Chasing the Dream on the World of Dreams. We call it Chasing the Dream because we're interested in all aspects of dreaming, including the science of dreams, lucid dreaming, history and anthropology of dreams, creativity in dreams, and consciousness, spirituality, and anomalous dream experiences. Although we can indefinitely dive deeper into the mystery of dreams, we may never be able to fully capture their significance or their mystery. Thus, we keep chasing the dream. Our mission is to make dreaming fun again by awakening the public to the joy and the significance and the mystery of dreams. So I'm Michelle. Um, I've been studying sleep and dreams in sleep laboratories for the past decade now. Um, I have my PhD in biomedical science where I did graduate training at the Dream and Nightmare Laboratory in Montreal. Uh, and then I also worked in the UK at the Swansea University Sleep Laboratory and now I'm working in Rochester, New York at a sleep and neurophysiology laboratory here. Um, and in the past 10 years, I've done studies looking at uh, the role of REM sleep in dreams and kind of normal sleep functions like for learning or for emotion regulation. Um, I've also looked at studies inducing lucid dreams in sleep laboratories and then other studies trying to use dreams for um, personal benefits, so using dream discussion to gain insight or to heal nightmares. Um, and most recently looking at dream engineering, which is how can we influence dreams using different technologies, um, potentially to enhance dream function or to repair nightmares, repair dreaming dis disturbances. So that's me. That's fantastic. And Patrick? Tell us about yourself. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Patrick McNamara, and I've been studying dreams for 30 or 40 years, I think. I first got interested in them in my undergraduate years when um, either a professor asked this question or I asked the question in the paper I had to write for them. Why is it that every 90 minutes our bodies get paralyzed so we can't move? And we have these enormous autonomic nervous system storms. And we're forced to watch these things we call dreams. And our sexual systems are intensely activated. And our thermal regulatory reflexes are suspended. Why would Mother Nature do something so strange? That's all, that, all of that is called REM sleep. So I've been um, trying to solve the biological mystery of REM sleep for many, many years now. And it's, although I've learned quite a bit, it's just become a deeper mystery, particularly the part about dreams. So um, I've approached dreams from an evolutionary perspective and doing many dream content studies. And oh yeah, I just finished this book. This just got published. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I think it was this year. Um, it's got some nice endorsements on the back from famous awesome. green researchers. So, and, and that I go over the complete um, evolutionary and neuroscience data on sleep, on REM sleep and dreams. And I take the position that uh, both REM sleep and dreams are intensely saturated with social phenomena mm -hmm. and yeah. social function associated with dreaming and REM sleep. But I in no way think that's the whole story. Mm -hmm. That's just the little <laughs> key Part of it. that the biology tells us. Yeah. But there's this whole universe of dreams out there that's much more mysterious and, and that I think um, holds the key to unlocking fundamental mysteries of consciousness and creativity. So that's who I am. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to having interesting conversations with other dreamers around yeah. the world. <laughs> Michelle, what would you like this podcast to be about? What I mean, in your, you know, there's a realistic Michelle. Mm -hmm. it's what it could be, you know, what it's probably going to be. And then there's, you know, what the your wildest dreams kind of thing, what it could be. Well, I think to start, I just, I really like the idea of having conversations with um, all of the 
I mean, there's so many dream researchers, I feel now doing really, that have been doing really good work for a long time. And it's, I just think it would be great to kind of collect, we'll form like a collection of dream researchers and interviews. And, you know, I've met a lot of people at conferences or visited research labs. And it's just, I think it would be nice to showcase all of the work that's being done. Because I think outside of our field, not many people really know that dream research is a surreal field of science and we're we're making progress so I think do you think a lot of people still think of dreams as nothing but you know like bizarre flux in the night kind of thing yeah well i think outside of our field maybe people don't realize how much how well we we've learned like what we're learning about how we can study it how we can capture it <laughs> what's what's the in your view what's the current popular view of dreams is it still freudian or something along those lines. Yeah, it depends a bit on culture, I think. I think some, a lot of people are, have been relatively dismissive of, of dreams. Like, yeah, they just- Because that's my sense, you know, that yeah. most, the, the average person thinks dreams are um, something that we really don't need to pay attention to. It's, they're not that medically important, not that scientifically important. And there are sort of bizarre things that happen during the night, and um, we don't need to pay attention to them at all. Uh, yeah. There's no good reason to. You know, occasionally we have a memorable dream, and it's mildly uh, bizarre, and we want to, you know, tell some friend about it because it was so unusual. Or, and occasionally there might be some very emotional dream. That, right. You know that haunts us for a few days but I think most people just think of their dreams as just I just don't understand them and uh but I don't need to and I don't want you know yeah they're they're hard to they don't know how to use them and so if we didn't know how to use something then we just say well then it's useless <laughs> so yeah pay the attention to it yeah but what but what is science saying about um I mean, is science saying that we should pay attention to them, or there, is there any benefit? Hmm, depends on the science. I think a lot of people say different things. I think, you know, we can learn a lot about ourselves through working, through paying attention to dreams, but the science is kind of still at a phase of deconstructing, I think, what, what it is that's creating the dream and how dreams are generated. So, I don't know, I think the science versus how we can personally use them are still a bit disconnected, you know? Like, I, kind of, I kind of agree, yeah, I think, I think that there, there's some good scientific evidence that uh, paying attention to your dreams will confer great benefits or can confer great benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not established science that that's the case. On the other hand, I agree with um, some philosophers and some scientists who say that if you really want to understand human beings and human consciousness, you'll need to grapple with dreams mm -hmm. because they're central to creating the human experience. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes philosophers understand our dreams more than scientists do. I think for me, I, I think remember, so. yeah, I remember um, like when I first started studying dreams as a scientist, we like at the beginning, I took a very limited approach to trying to scientifically study dreams because it's, it's hard to study them otherwise because they're so they can be there's so much variation and they're so they're so hard to capture and they're so hard to get reports from and so I would take a very limited view like is the dream bizarre is it emotional and just like you know scaled ratings of, of what yeah. the dream is like and now over time I've started to really you know do more research where I'm having hour-long interviews with somebody about their dream and it's and I think going more you know going more deep into the dream experience is, is necessary. And it's, it's hard as scientists to do that, but I think it's a necessary step. Yeah, yeah because you, um, 
miss so much if, if you if you don't take the narrative seriously you mm -hmm. know the dream report seriously and um, you miss something essential about what dreaming is you know sometimes the dream report seems nonsensical and there's a lot of bizarre elements and some of the actions um, violate the laws of physics and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we tend to dismiss them as crazy things that happen in the night. But when you um, read hundreds of dreams and, um, you know, really take that content seriously, some patterns begin to emerge. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and if you ask people more more questions, I mean, a lot of times what seems bizarre to us, for the person, there's a very simple link. Like, it might seem, I, I had a dream that uh, when I was in the sleep lab, I was acting as a participant for one of my colleagues, and in the dream, she came into my room to wake me up, but she was a cat. She was this gray cat that jumped on my bed. And that might just seem, yeah, that's like a bizarre dream element. But if I think about it for a second, then it's like, um, every day my gray cat jumps on my bed and wakes me up. So the fact that I was in the sleep lab and she was going to come in and wake me up, that association is actually, it's very direct, you know, it's, it's not like really bizarre out of nowhere um, association. So I think a lot of times if you get more information from the dreamer, they can reveal like, they can say what, what the associations are, they can say if they had a recent experience that's related to the dream, like that's how we discovered um, you know, there's the day residue, which is pretty obvious. So you mm -hmm. dream about things that are related to your experiences of the previous day, but then mm -hmm. we see these patterns emerging over, over longer periods of time. Like something that happened recently is associated to something that happened like a week ago, yeah. um, or you can see associations with like a month ago or like when mm -hmm. I was a child and you can see patterns in, in what types of information and when the information is coming from. And that's really, that's really cool. <laughs> Agreed. Um, do you think dreams are just about memories? Just uh, involve memory processing or just a jumble of discarded um, memory images? Or? I think it's about memory, but my idea of memory, I guess, is pretty broad. I mean, I think all of human experience is based in memory. You know, the way that I perceive the world is based on my experience of the world. So, so it's not just like, I don't think it's just a brain based memory. I think it's mm -hmm. just whole bodily um, awareness and knowledge of, of what it is to be me and what my, what, what my worldview is, what I think the world is like. Yeah. Um, well, would you, so does your view of uh, memory then encompass things like totally new phenomena that you haven't encountered before. That can't be memories, right? If it's totally new, you've never encountered it before. It can't be memories. Right. right. Yeah, that is <clears throat> a conundrum. <laughs> so, if, but, and that occurs in dreams, right? Yeah. Totally new stuff. Mm -hmm. They're very creative. Mm -hmm. yeah. Therefore, dreams can't just be about memories, right? Or new combinations of memories. So, what so, but that's, but that's what I'm saying. Toledo. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I encounter in my dreams and I, and I see stuff in dream reports that is totally new mm -hmm. that I've never encountered before. As far as I can tell, when I really probe my memories, those images are not there. Right. 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 Therefore the source of that image in the dream is not my memory. It's coming from someplace else. Right. It's a creative process. Yeah. That can happen. In, so yeah, so it's an imaginative process. I was going to say that that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there, there is a form of imagination that's based on memory. Mm -hmm. No question about it. But there's another form of imagination that's totally creative and brand new. You know? mm -hmm. I think that really comes out in dreams, mm -hmm. even more than during the daytime. Yeah. 
Like there's, there's, there's something that dreams can do that our waking consciousness can't do. As a Liberge quote, it's always said, waking, waking experience is constrained by, by the concreteness of the external world. So we're, we're like constrained by, because the world is, is continuous and solid. And so we, we're limited in what we can <laughs> imagine and experience. Whereas in dreams, because there's no, there's no, there's nothing concrete or continuous that the whole world is changing as we imagine it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just one example. There's a, there's many other examples of creativity in dreams, you know. Um, but but it, if you agree with that um, hypothesis, you know, that, that dreams are creative and they, they yield information that we can't get through other means, then for me, the question becomes, what is that? What are dreams doing for us that nothing else is doing for us? And, you know, and, and the more I study dreams, and I've been studying dreams now for over, well, 30 years now, the more I'm convinced that the information that dreams are yielding to us is absolutely vital. You know, that it's, it's um, there's, there's this, um, uh, you know, phrase, the unknown unknowns. The, the surrealists made a big deal out of this um, way before, uh, what was his name? The, the defense, US defense chief made a, called the unknown unknowns. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so there's the known knowns, there's the unknown unknowns, and then there's the unknown unknowns, you know, mm -hmm. stuff that we don't even know that we don't know. Most of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, most of the really important stuff is the stuff that we, we don't even know that we don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of stuff that we're, we, we can get in dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And therefore, you as an individual viewing this podcast, or, you know, it's absolutely vital for you to pay attention to your dreams. If, if, some, if, if dreams are yielding that kind of information, mm -hmm then that's gold for you. It's like yeah. finding gold, you know? Right, right. And, and this, I think lucid dreams are, would, would be a very great way to discover the unknown unknowns. Yeah, if the dreams listen to you. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot, of, a lot of ifs there. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. One person that I've I've kind of read a lot about his view on dreams is Eugene uh, Genlin. No oh yeah, I remember him from the. Mm -hmm. I, I read one of his works a long time ago, but I haven't seen stuff. So he talks a lot about dreams, as they're they're kind of like showing you a way to move forward because they they bring up things that you're kind of stuck on, but they 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 give you a way to move forward if you pay attention to them and if you. Um, you know, you can work with them in waking life, but also if the more that you work with your dreams in waking life, the more you, you almost, you work with them in the dreaming life too. Like the way mm -hmm. that instead of just staying in, in habitual patterns, like you start to, you know, where if you have this recurring bad dream where your reaction is always to run away or something, the more you work with your dreams in waking life, then when you dream it again, you, you have this kind of insight, like, oh, maybe I can change how I act mm -hmm. in this situation. And that allows you to, to move forward and to enter into a new way of being. And um, so, yeah, so he talks a lot about this as a forward, dreams as a forward moving process and um, shifting you into new ways of being. Yeah, so I think, yeah, the more that you pay attention to your dreams, the more you start to, to see that and you can see yourself changing and you can see yourself growing and you can, it's, it's, it's really empowering, I think, to see yourself changing in a dream, especially if you come from this mindset that dreams are just out of my control and they're useless and I can't help who I am in my dreams, right? And if you see yourself start to change in dreams and you really see like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of the master of my own, my own life and my own, my, my, my habits and my, my way of being. So, yeah. Uh, that's so true. I mean, uh, 
and we get evidence for there, there's something about dreams that um, allows you to make breakthroughs like that mm -hmm. you know from yeah. old patterns and we know that one of the most effective uh, therapies for nightmares is imagery rehearsal mm -hmm. therapy where you literally confront say the monster in the dream and then restructure that monster and suddenly you're not having repetitive nightmares anymore mm -hmm. you yeah. break through you know just through the dream by yeah. doing some dream work literal dream work so yeah. what is it about dreams that allows allows us to break those old perseverative patterns do you think i don't know yeah as you're saying that it does seem like yeah there is something unique about about the dream state that is almost a more malleable and there's yeah there's more possibility for change in it it seems maybe like in neuroscience terms it's like a neuroplastic state and you're, there's more neuroplasticity you're more i don't know something i don't know <laughs> yeah, i i think you're on to something there i think it is uh there's greater plasticity mm -hmm. uh, well for, first of all we know it's a highly cholinergic state Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. that alone increases plasticity in the in certain regional sites. Right. Now that all have to do with habit and memories. You know, mm -hmm. so limbic and basal ganglia. You know, so um, I I think there's something to be said for dreaming as a very um, highly plastic state. So neuronally things may be easier to change. Right. What can we learn from, from the artists about dreams? Is it back to the theme of uh, creativity in dreams, maybe? I mean, what, what I mean, <clears throat> the, there, there's stuff that the scientists can't capture about dreams, like the, you know, the, the, the experiential feel of dreams, whereas the artists, yeah. much more easily, you know? That's very I, 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 I saw that um, picture of the Basinski picture you sent of the, like of this cabin. Maybe we could put up a, you know, like put, put up the actual picture during the mm -hmm. podcast. This cabin, like in, in this, I'm probably not describing it correctly, but in this ancient sort of feel to it, like a hermit's cabin out in a dark forest. Um, right, yeah. Uh, but why would an uh, image like that, like capture something about dreams that's so correct and real? Yeah, there is something that art can capture. Just a felt sense of like what it is to be in a dream, visual arts or music or... I, I think one reason why is because art is really good at capturing timelessness. Mm. Like it takes us out of um, the subjective sense of time and puts us into this timeless realm. Mm -hmm. And that's what dreams do too. Yeah. Normally when you're in dreams, you're not thinking, yeah, you're not, you don't have that observer view on time. You just, you're just in the moment. Right. Mostly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what to call that sense timelessness maybe or in a, a sense of a an eternal feel to it i mean i i if you're if you've ever had the experience of being like intensely passionately in love mm -hmm. and when when you're with the person you're in love with there is a sense of the eternal like a timeless yeah feel to it like this this moment is just so suffused with yeah yeah, the moment becomes yeah. uh, used as a good word. Uh, and I think dream sort of uh, gives gives us a lot of those kinds of moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which artists capture more. And artists science. really do put us in that space as well. Yeah, I think that's true. There's something, it's not just time though, there's something about being in a dream that just a different <laughs> it's a different way of looking at the world i don't really know how to describe it 
Well, that's what we're doing, Michelle. We're chasing the dream because we can't, <laughs> we can't capture it. Yeah, it's something about timelessness and the eternal. And it, it, it gives us a different way to look at the world. And, um, and, and I've never seen, neither in philosophers or scientific accounts of dreams, like really capture the sense of just what dreams are doing mm-hmm. you know, for us or where we we are at experientially yeah when we're in a dream like um we know that the executive you know centers are sort of down regulated mm-hmm. to some extent well, well the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is down regulated but the ventromedial prefrontal cortex not so much you know it's still you know it, it, gets, it changes but not as much as the dorsolateral Mm-hmm. Well, it's not like we lo- lose all executive control and or right. yeah. and top-down inhibitory influences are abolished. No, no. Um, yeah. Some of it is, but and then the limbic system is is more highly activated. The amygdala very highly activated. You know, right. Uh, uh, all the fun and dreams, all the emotion. <laughs> yeah, and that's emotional. why you get get very emotional dreams. Yeah. Um, but then our body is paralyzed, mm-hmm. is sexually very activated, although it doesn't seem to be in a, in a you know, eroticized form, you know, like the, the, the body is sexually activated, you know. So, right. um, so it's, it's extremely strange physiological state, this REM sleep, where we get vivid dreams. The executive centers are slightly down-regulated. The emotional centers are up-regulated. Mm-hmm. You get sexually activated, and yet you're paralyzed. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> Michelle, tell me yeah. why. Paralyzed, but there is activation occurring throughout the body as well. Mm-hmm. You see changes and You just can't move. Right. You can't fully move, right? <laughs> The eyes can move. The eyes move, but you get twitches in all the muscles. Twitches, yeah, yeah. So. Especially the ears, yeah. Especially what? The ears, yeah. The ears? Mm-hmm. Oh, the middle ears. Middle mm-hmm. ear muscles? Yeah. I haven't read too much about that, but I'm interested in. Me either. Studying that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you do get these twitches. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but you're essentially paralyzed. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, and that's, I mean, that's, we, we need to, need to do, uh, well, let's, let's debate that for a second, because okay. this, this is big pet peeve of mine. Um, that we're, we're normally told that REM sleep is associated with paralysis so that we don't act out our dreams, right? Yes, that's what we're normally told, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> and yet, and yet we, we have pretty vivid dreams in non-REM sleep too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I've been, I've been reading a lot about twitches lately because I'm really fascinated by them. Um, what makes them fascinating? Tell me. Well, so just the idea that that twitches might not just be because this is what we're normally told too that twitches are just a byproduct of it's, mm-hmm. it's dreaming activity motor activity yeah. that's just leaking out from dreams that's, that's what i've practice. always thought that's what we've always thought but um so what i've been it's what i taught my students yeah <laughs> <laughs> so well, tell me reading recently is that twitches and bodily hmm. activation during REM sleep could actually be developmentally important that it's a way of kind of activating neuronal activating systems and calibrating uh, your bodily kind of the body math in the brain so it's that's that makes sense. Yeah. The theory is like why REM sleep is so important for development, like development yeah. motor development yeah. but why do we get twitches then when we're adults well we're still like I mean, we're still developing yeah, yeah we're always developing right so yeah. Yeah. if you learn it I like it or something then it's it's like 
you know, your brain like sends a little probe out and it's like, okay, if I use this muscle, then this finger moves. And yeah, I, I like it. I like it. See, see folks, mm -hmm. you know, it, even if you're studying dreams for a lifetime, still learning stuff every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I had just dismissed twitches as, you know, secondary effects, of, you know, but, but that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it and when you so you take something like that that people have just said for so long, which is they just they just leak out through paralysis, and then you really examine it. It's like really like all of evolution, all of these species have twitches, and it's all just yeah. it's just a, a leaking out. And so maybe yeah, it doesn't doesn't make sense. It, it, there should be a fun, functional explanation, and that that so, would be a good one. So then we go to dreams and say the same yeah. thing. There's probably some function of dreams they're not just yeah <laughs> there's there there is this so i mean we should just say that uh, for the longest time there's been this set of camps in my view in, in, in the, the dream world um there's some who say that dreams are adaptive mm -hmm. evolutionarily speaking and then there are others saying no they're just quote unquote spandrels you know they're just Right. No real adaptive function. They're just there. What's adaptive is something else, like maybe the REM sleep physiology, but mm -hmm. the, the cognitive stuff is just byproduct epiphenomena of the adaptive function. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always felt that that dreams themselves are adaptations. Well, what's your view? Yeah, I agree with that <clears throat> so far. <laughs> How come? Why? What's convinced you? Well, I mean, I think to question whether, to, if you want to take the perspective that dreaming and the conscious experience is completely not functional, then it calls into question, I think, all of conscious experience. Like, if, you, if you're really taking that kind of biological reductive perspective like the only thing that's functional is what's happening in the brain and perhaps in the body and the subjective experience we can just dismiss that well that that calls into question subjective experience all the time i think you yeah. know but i i feel like <clears throat> to be you know to have consciousness or what i guess subjective consciousness um in waking life and in dreams I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 a it's a fundamentally irrational, not to be too dramatic about it, but irrational response to say that um, uh, subjective qualia is just epiphenomena, you know, and, and serves no function, and the only real thing, quote unquote, is is brain function. Right, right. You know, it's 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 just super reductive, and it seems to me irrational stance to take. You know, so, but what kind of adaptation would would dreams then be? Like, what? I mean, we we have we have a you know a range of views on that. So yeah. first, there's so there's all the people in the dream world who say their dreams are just spandrels. And at least one or two philosophers who don't know a lot about dreams have taken that stance. But then there's the philosophers and the scientists who say, okay, dreams do probably are functional and do have an a, a, a adaptive purpose. So then we go through, okay, what are the hypotheses? So um, the ones in my view that have some empirical support are like the threat simulation, social simulation, um, memory processing for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then emotion, some sort of em, uh, emotional regulation of some kind, you know, like um, to uh, uh, fear extension processes, you know, so that, you, you know, even though we all face traumas, we can still carry on because mm -hmm. we can reduce uh, the amount to which fear sh controls our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, and we do that via dreams through the fear extinction circuit. Right. So, right, right. so that's at least three, you know, sets of yes. views on, yeah, threat right. simulation, social memory processing, emotion, so four, emotional right. regulation. Mm 
Can you think of any others? Uh, creativity, what I, you know. Yeah, those are the, the main camps of function. I think the simulation views, um, you know, they, they, so they've said threat and social are evolutionarily um, important for us to rehearse in our dreams. But I think the simulation views more broadly, it's, it's really, it becomes more relevant to your, your current life. So there's evolutionary functions that maybe dreams and REM sleep um, preferentially rehearse threats and social situations because those are important for the evolution of our species yeah. um, but then that becomes you know based on your current life you know that what are what are the things that are important for you and your life to rehearse because um, you know we're not necessarily exposed to the same types of threats that we were through evolution so so it kind are you, of are, adapted to current current experience current life are you saying that's an argument against the adaptive or say the threat simulation view? Or are you saying we just need to understand it that way? I think it just needs to be expanded or something like it's, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. Yeah. We need to, we need to take the threat simulation hypothesis and the social sim simulation hypothesis in that way, you know, like, mm -hmm. What is it doing? What what did it do for us in in the evolutionary landscape when it first evolved, and what what is it doing for us now? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. sure, yeah. What so what which do you favor? It's possible that they all could be true, right? Oh, um, yeah, I think they're all true. <laughs> yeah, I think they 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 certainly all have some empirical su support. Yeah, yeah. You know so. Um, I, I, 10 or 15 years ago, put out this idea of, um, that's sort of linked to the emotional regulation hypothesis that, uh, I, currently I, I'm sort of, um, with the social simulation mm -hmm. people, but, um, a, a long time ago, uh, uh I put out the signaling hypothesis, which is linked to the emotional regulation stuff, costly signaling, you know, because um, it would account for both um, uh, the reason why dreams are so important for emotional regulation, but it would also account for bizarreness in dreams and for why we get the unknown unknowns and creativity in dreams. I, I didn't describe it that way at the time, but um, it, and, and I was never that wedded to the hypothesis. And mm -hmm. but that's 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 it's one I still have a sweet spot for, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, How does it um, account for bizarreness? Oh, well, that's um, so. I mean, the, the, the classic example of costly signaling in, in evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. is um, the, the peacock's tail, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, why on earth would the male, right. you know, this huge elaborate tail that, you know, just makes it hard to escape from predators. And, and the, the theory is that it's a costly signal. So the females say, they look at this big tail and they say, well, he must have excellent genes, you know, because he can create this and still survive, you know, he still has this elaborate metabolically costly thing and yet he can still survive so he has good genes so let's mate with him and then that fuels more and more elaborate peacock tails. So it's a costly signal, the, the peacock okay. tail. So for dreams, um, and you have to understand that we're, we're, we're now thinking uh, 50,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago when people were sharing dreams, you know, they, they would have a dream and they would share them, presumably. Mm -hmm. So who knows, but, um, so, uh, dreams were always thought of as involuntary products right. of the mind, you know, I, I did not produce it. And so they're an index of me in mm -hmm. a way that only involuntary things can be. 
and they can't be dishonest signals, you know, so. Right. So when I share a highly emotional dream with a lot of bizarre elements, it's a costly signal because I'm, I'm sharing something about me which is involuntary and it has this elaborate information about me and yet it's putting me on the line in the tribe and so on and so forth. So, you know, under all this baggage, the theory undoubtedly collapses, but I still have a sweet <laughs> spot for it, you know. That means that us dream researchers are more evolved. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. That's that's what the costly signaling my hypothesis would predict. But the, the 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 ones who load high on the dream spectrum, you know, that are close to their dreams, that want to share their dreams, pay attention to their dreams, where dream images um, um, escape into waking consciousness, and you're right on that borderline where you know you're slipping into a hallucinosis, you know, but you're not. You're still in contact with reality, but but you're still you know that the costly signaling hypothesis would yeah, say yeah. yeah you're you're you have the best genes. But then what about animal dreams? They're not sharing their dreams with anyone, but I think they're still dreaming. Yeah, they're, they're, I agree. I I do think animals dream, mm -hmm. and. Um, the costly signaling hypothesis would work for them by making them do stuff that, you know, act out their dreams in some way. You know, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I just came up with that hypothesis 15, 20 years ago and, but I've never worked on it. And because yeah. I could never think of a way to gather data to, to falsify it or to really test it, you know? Right. So, I just didn't pursue it. Yeah, again, so um, Mark Blager was doing some work on dream sharing and empathy and functions of, of sharing dreams and he's finding, well, I think we've, this has been found before, but that, that sharing your dreams has benefits for yourself, but also for the people who listen to the dream. I believe it. So it increases empathy towards the person who shares their dream and it there kind of you go. what you're saying, that they're revealing themselves in a very honest way um, it's kind of, it's a, dreams are weird like that. You can be very, you can share some very personal details without feeling as, as a, I don't know, nervous about it because it's like, it was just a dream, but it's also, it's, it's it still really reveals yourself to somebody. Precisely. Yeah. That's, that's what makes them special mm -hmm. socially. Yeah. You can say, you can own it and still disown it. Yeah. You know, you know, you can say, Hey, I had this dream last night, you know, and it involved me like completely, uh, you know, <laughs> doing this inappropriate stuff with you, you know. And, uh, but no, it's just a dream. It's just you know? a dream. It's just a dream. So what do you think of it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 you have to realize that our ancestors shared dreams constantly. I mean, mm -hmm. that everything we know about um, traditional societies and you know, dreams were central to their groups. Mm -hmm. You know, like you see that in the accounts of uh, Native American dream traditions all the time. Right. And this, is, this was a regular thing. It's not just New Age bullshit, you know. The, 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 the Indians took dreams very, very seriously mm -hmm. to the point where somebody would share a dream. And if the tribe felt like that's a, that's a big dream, you know, they stop everything. They start to take the images in the dream, create garments out of them, create um, hides out of them, you know, create dances, yeah. songs, folklore. I mean, tools even right, came, right. Came, came out of dreams, you know, so. Wow. So dreams were generators of culture. You know, both, when you look at the, the African traditions, dream traditions, you mm -hmm. look at Native Americans, you look at all these traditional societies, that, that comes across over and over and over again, the centrality of the dream for these uh, small scale societies. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to assume dream sharing was universal and taken very seriously. And because, probably because it, 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 it allowed people to do precisely what you just said, that mm -hmm. 
this this is really me, but not me. You know, so you you could you could move into the social realm in this uh, liminal space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Accomplish things that you couldn't otherwise do. Yeah, I was thinking earlier that is another part of the kind of the experiential quality of dreaming is that when you're in a dream, you feel. I mean, more uh, like connection to the other characters in the dream. You feel like yeah. that that everything, myself and the characters in the dream, we're all connected in a way. And I think that can kind of carry over into wakefulness too, which is part of the social simulation theory that yeah. that it it changes the way we relate to other people. And so, yeah, the social quality of dreams can really it can have a very kind of community building pro-social function if you if you share them <laughs> yeah i think yeah i think i think there's even data to show that even if you don't share the dreams mm -hmm. you know that you, dreams can in, um impel you to approach somebody right you know it, it, it can shape attachment patterns i guess yeah you know, that's what i want to say um but what, what do you, th that, that raises a whole other question that I was uh, interested to ask you about because I know you're interested in lucid dreams and the, the status of other characters in dreams. Are they just creations of our consciousness or how should right. we think of them? Yeah, there's kind of, ex okay, experientially there's, there <clears throat> seems to be different categories of characters and this seems to be a common experience for lucid dreamers maybe non-lucid dreamers as well, that, that there's different types of characters and, and it seems like people keep reporting this. So there's the characters that are like zombies, so the characters that yeah. seem to not know they exist and they, you try to talk to them and they kind of yeah. ignore you and, and they seem to just be like images almost. They're just, they don't really have any sense of purpose or volition or they're just kind of images. Um, and then there's characters that seem to be, I think this is Robert Wagner's term, he calls them puppets. Maybe, I think it was him. So it's like, they'll, they'll interact with you, but they seem to kind of just reflect whatever you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. So if you think that they're gonna, they're gonna start yeah. laughing, then they start laughing. If you think they're gonna be angry, then they get angry. And so those seem to be just projected, projections of whatever you are thinking. But then there's some characters that really seem, they seem to have their own identity they seem like you try to interact with them and then they they're doing whatever they want to do or they have information beyond what what you could know so they're independent of your will they seem to be yeah, yeah. which well what, what what's your feeling are they or aren't they they seem to be or just i would say that they are yeah but because <laughs> they, 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 they they seem to be for sure yeah. mm -hmm. And, but I, I think the data is suggesting more and more, and this is coming from the lucid dreaming research, and maybe people like Wagner and Altoli and others, that the, the dream, these dream characters who are independent of our will have information that we could not give them. Yeah. Could That's not have come from us. Right. Right. I know. The, so the skeptics, which we have to... Again, we're back to the unknown unknowns. Yeah. I, the skeptics just say, you know, like in all of psychology, you can just say, well, it's, it's information you didn't know you had, or it was in your subconscious, or it was, you know, that's what the skeptics would say. Because we've, we've been exposed to tons of information in our life that we're not consciously aware of all of it, of course. So, so when people have things like precognitive dreams or learning information from a dream character, they say, well, you, you knew that, you just didn't know you knew, knew it. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, and that, that <laughs> and, uh, yes, and that to me, that objection needs to be taken seriously and addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those objections can be addressed. Uh, I mean, first of all, you have to say, okay, that objection is, can lead to an infinite regress. No matter what information right. I bring up, you're just going to say, well, you could have learned it implicitly. Right. Well, of course, yes, that's true about virtually anything, you know. Yeah. So where does it stop? Okay, so those critics need to take a more principled stance and say, we will believe that it's independent information 
if it's X, Y, and Z, you know. Um, and I think we, we can in, then in principle settle the debate. Right. That it's, it's not just coming from <clears throat> implicit sources that we unconsciously picked up. It's coming from someplace else. We don't know where. But that's a whole, <clears throat> I mean, that has, that's a whole paradigm shift in, in what yes. Western science thinks of as, as human knowledge and human yeah. Okay, so so let's get really weird then on, on this on this initial podcast. Really go full, <laughs> full scale new age craziness um, because you and I are both on psychology today, and we you know, and we have to post periodically. And, uh, I don't know how much longer I'm going to do it because I'm getting bored with it. But really, oh yeah, you've been doing it a while. Yeah, but the 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 posts that I got. Um, the most responses to, I'm, and I'm talking about thousands of responses. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, was one on um, dreams as a portal into other worlds. Oh, wow, yeah. You know, the, the multi-universe, the multiverse hypothesis from quantum physics. Okay. So I... I as, as I laid it out in the post and saying like, first of all, scientists are not agreed on multiverse, you know, so it's just one hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And um, the ones who, even the ones who say that there are infinite numbers of other worlds, even those scientists say there's no principled way that we could get information from those other worlds to our world or vice versa. Okay. And then there's some philosophers who, um, you know, modal, who use modal logic, who make similar hypotheses say that modal logic implies an infinity of other worlds. But they too say that there are very strong constraints on mm -hmm. communication between those worlds. So, so if we think of dreams as a portal into some other universe, well, Currently, both the philosophy and the science seem to suggest that there's no principled way that we can, you know, get information across. Um, so, but if there was a principled <laughs> way, then I then I said, dreams seem to be. Um, we should put dreams as a top candidate for that portal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but why would it have to be information from other worlds? Because I, I think it could be, I mean, there's so much in this world already, and that not just currently or where I am locally, but, um, you know, maybe from, from the past or from the future, or from individuals on the other side of the earth or from, you know, collective collective knowledge that we may have together that we can't access you know I don't have this knowledge in my own brain but collectively I can access that in the dream so is that the, the Jungian hypothesis like the collective unconscious or are you thinking in those terms or or just yeah I guess it, he used the term collective unconscious I guess I just use it broadly as like it some that we're all um we're all kind of Part of the same material and we're accessing the same information and in that we can oops <laughs> um, so, so so are you are you saying um that we should uh uh entertain the veracity of things like precognitive dreams that kind of thing i think They're, definitely yeah. yeah i think so people have a you know a resistance to things like precognition or um Another one that's studied is like remote viewing. So, so being able to see something that's beyond your immediate yeah. sensory perception. Yeah. Um, but I think that those types of things really could be explained scientifically and even materially um, if we just broaden our perspective a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea of precognition, you know, just because we perceive time to be linear, I mean, it's not. <laughs> You yeah. know, so yeah, yeah. So and I, and I, I think there's some pretty good data that I mean, yeah, 
precognitive precogn dreams occur. And, and in fact, they probably are very frequent, you know, like Carlisle Smith's work we talked about before. I think, you know, he's just, he's, he's just saying, well, look at they, they occur pretty often, you know? Right, right. You know, so I don't know why or if they're really accessing future events, but some, you know, what we standardly call precognitive dreams occur fairly often in quite a few people. Yeah. And the data is just there. Yeah. You know, so we need an explanation. Yeah, and a lot of people will say that they've had them and, they, you know, we don't even think that much about it. Like, it's not, I mean, unless you have like a really big one where you predict a really big event, then then maybe you are really impressed by it. But a lot of people will say, yeah, I had a dream that she was going to call and then she called. <laughs> and it's like, it's just yeah. a normal part of experience. But Yeah. I mean, the the deflationary account of it is uh, the law of large numbers, right? The, right. So it's a coincidence, essentially, because pretty much bound yeah. to happen a couple times. But I don't think that it really works. Yeah, but <laughs> so. why? Why? Why is that more can, more like easier for people to believe than? Agree. Yeah, <laughs> and then we have the, the the interesting phenomena of shared dreams, which I still think yeah. hasn't really been explained. That um, as well, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, because but particularly among twins, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. that would be the, a good study. Yeah. Yeah, that's crying out to be done, but because of this dogma. We, we can't do it, you know, this, I don't know what to call the dogma, like, um, I don't know what to talk, it's not just materialist dogma, mm -mm. Um, what is it, I don't know. Well, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's like really just it's restricting your understanding of the world to what you can physically see and what you personally experience, which is huh. just a very, very limited view. I mean, we're, we're limited by very, you know, sense, uh, sensory systems that we think this is all there is to the world, but <laughs> that's just completely false. I mean, we're totally we're false. So, such yeah. limited aspects of the world around us and of ourselves. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing perhaps our podcast will do is um, open up Mm. these um, relatively taboo topics to real scientific research. Yeah, that would be great, yeah. yeah. That would be, uh, that alone would be a huge service. Mm -hmm. You know, besides archiving conversations with very interesting thinkers about all this stuff, but to, to broaden the conversation. Yeah, yeah, I think those conversations happen, you know, with when you're at the conferences or where you talk yeah. to other scientists, but it'll be good to put them out there. I mean, it's, I think it's okay to think about these things, even if, even if we end up being wrong, it's, it's important to think about them and to question them. Yeah, well, they're, they're a big part of uh, people's lives. You know, a lot of people have precognitive dreams. Yeah. And they're, they find them very impressive. And a lot of people have mutual dreams and, uh, you know, uh, that, to me, that's the evolutionary, um, the true evolutionary environment of dreaming is sleeping in the same environment or bed yeah. with a partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a study that just came out recently about how when two people sleep in the same bed, they actually, their sleep structure synchronizes yeah. more than when they're sleeping separately. So you're actually, your, your brain is following yeah patterns which is awesome <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm i've been working on a, a a post for the blog um there's some new technology um what are they calling it uh, the double coil or something like that where you can image the brains of two people at once yeah hyper scanning imaging two people at once yeah at once except when they're asleep that you know oh, really? that's what's not been done yeah you know, so then you'll be able to see, you know, how the brain synchronized during sleep, you know, that. Brains, bodies. Yeah, I mean. Heartbeats synchronize sometimes when they're in the same room. There was a study on that a while ago, so. 
we're, we're, we're not shaped, we're not evolved to sleep alone. Mm. You know, our body's temper, temperature regulation occurs because of our bed partners, you know. So, um, I mean, just every, just every part of our physiology is designed. You know, so we can't understand dreams just by looking at an isolated brain. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so. Brain in a vat. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> <laughs>